This video is about the history of the atomic theory. The atomic theory is an explanation for what makes up matter. We know that matter is the stuff that's all around us. It's the stuff that makes up us. It's the stuff that makes up the room around you. It's the stuff that makes up the universe. It ends up that the universe is made of atoms. Uh, the theory explains that it is made of atoms. It also talks about what's inside the atoms and a little bit about how the atoms behave. Uh, this video is just like a lot of the other videos. Uh, this is just like the in-class lecture. You should take down notes. You should take down all the bulleted items. You should also copy down the figures that I point out because those figures, those diagrams are very important to your understanding of uh, this system. I'll tell you when you don't have to copy down a figure though. This all started with the ancient Greeks. Uh, ancient Greek philosophers were arguing about what's stuff made of? You know, the table in front of you, what's it made of? Uh, and they were arguing, you know, maybe it's made of more stuff. Maybe it's made of fluids. Maybe it's made of uh, elements like earth, wind, fire, and water. Uh, that was one of the ideas. Uh, this guy named Democritus said that everything's made of atoms. And he came up with this idea because what happens if you cut something in half? So you take a piece of paper, you cut it in half. And then you cut it in half again. And then you cut it in half again. And then you cut it in half again. And eventually, Democritus said, you won't be able to cut it in half anymore because you'll be down to the tiniest little piece. And you can't cut that in half. And that's why he gave it the Greek word atomos, which means indivisible. So everything is made of tiny indivisible particles. He was a philosopher, though. Philosophers don't do experiments. They're idea men. They just come up with ideas. And by the way, there's idea women now. Um, but back in ancient Greece, uh, unfortunately, it was a male vocation only. Um, so this was Democritus' idea. It's just philosophy. It's not science. He didn't do experiments. Uh, it ended up that you had to wait till the 16-1700s in the Enlightenment for people to start doing experiments with this stuff. Robert Boyle was a scientist who did experiments. He thought that matter was made of what are called tiny corpuscles. That's a very old-timey word. Uh, but if you know the word corpse, you know that corpses are bodies. So he thought that matter was made of tiny little bodies. Sounds like atoms to me. Uh, he did experiments that showed that gases behaved a certain way. We're going to learn about Boyle's Law later this year. And those experiments kind of gave little hints that, well, maybe air is made of little particles. Uh, Boyle wasn't the only person working. Across the English Channel was a French guy named Anton Lavoisier. Anton Lavoisier did experiments where he very carefully weighed stuff. So when Lavoisier weighed um, things that he burned, he found out that when you burn something, you don't destroy matter. If you capture all the gases that are made when you burn it, it weighs the same after as before. And so Lavoisier, by knowing this, figured that there had to be something inside matter that couldn't be broken down. So that sounds like it could be atoms too. And Lavoisier was the one who uh, stated the law of conservation of mass. Fun story about Lavoisier. So this is the late 1700s in France. And he had very, very precise scientific machinery that took a lot of money to build this machinery. Um, you have to have a really good job in order to do that. And he, it ended up that he worked as the chief tax collector in Paris. Not a very popular person. Late 1700s, Paris, unpopular government official. Uh, he got his chop, head chopped off, guillotined during the French Revolution. Poor Lavoisier. Uh, say dommage. Uh, this is Joseph Proust. He came up with the law of definite proportions. You need to know this law. It says that uh, when you analyze the elements in a compound, they'll always have the same ratio. For instance, if you take water, it'll always be 8 grams oxygen to 1 gram hydrogen. So again, 8 grams oxygen to 1 gram hydrogen. Now, no matter how much water you have, it'll always be the same ratio. So if you have uh, 18 grams of water, uh, it'll be 16 grams oxygen, 2 grams hydrogen. Well, this was interesting. But then an English school teacher named John Dalton figured out his own law. He figured out the law of multiple proportions. Well, what happens if you analyze more than one compound? Well, something really interesting happens. It ends up that if you look on uh, under the law of multiple proportions here, so this is taking the ratio of two different compounds to each other. Compound A has 1.66 grams oxygen to 1 gram carbon. Compound B has 2.66 grams oxygen to 1 gram carbon. Isn't it reasonable to say that compound A has twice as much oxygen as compound B? Right, 
The point of all this ratio stuff is that there ends up that inside these compounds, there's got to be something that's like a piece, like Legos. So if you take a Lego that has two little dots on it, and you take other Legos and put it on it, there are one dot each, you're dealing with things that are pieces. Those are Legos. Just like in the real world, it ends up there are atoms. So Dalton uh, went and took this idea and wrote a whole book about it. You don't need to copy this down. But this is a, a page from his book on the left. And on the right of this slide is the old alchemist symbols for elements, because we hadn't come up with the modern letters yet. Dalton ended up being right about a lot of stuff. He was right that hydrogen was the lightest element, and that it had a mass of 1. All right, He wasn't right about some of the other elements, but he got the general gist down that uh, nitrogen, carbon, and oxygen comes next. He didn't have the numbers right, he didn't have the order right, but at least they are the next thing on, along the line, which is good. But here's where Dalton really excelled. On the last slide, compound A had one oxygen and one carbon. Compound B had two oxygens, one carbon. We now know the name of those things. Compound B was carbon dioxide, CO2, and compound A was carbon monoxide. And Dalton was right about the fact that they combined to make compounds, and it was atoms that were doing it. So all these little circles are atoms, and that's what Dalton was so famous for, and that's what his idea was. So he took the idea from Democritus, he did experiments, and he came up with a theory that explained why compounds were behaving the way they were. There's, there's, little, there's little pieces going on inside these uh, compounds and molecules. All right, Dalton wrote a book, so of course he needed words. This was his atomic theory, so he listed off uh, this information. That elements are composed of tiny individual particles called atoms. Seems obvious, Democritus said it, but Dalton was the one who had the evidence to back it up. That atoms of the same element are identical, and atoms of different elements are fundamentally different. Dalton explained why you can't turn lead into gold. Uh, the alchemists tried this. It doesn't work. The reason is there are lead atoms and there are gold atoms, and you cannot turn lead atoms into gold atoms. You can just turn compounds into other compounds. That's what uh, bullets number three and four are about, that compounds are actually uh, ratios of elements because they're the particles. Um, whole number ratios, that's a really important uh, phrase to know, simple whole number ratios. And that chemical reactions occur when you rearrange, join, or uh, separate atoms. Uh, we know that there are bonds now. And uh, that's also what Dalton talked about. All right, Dalton's theory wasn't completely right. Uh, just like in science, uh, a theory is an explanation. But if you do more experiments, you might find out that the theory is not completely true. Nowadays, we know that atoms can be divided. They have protons, neutrons, and electrons inside of them. So Dalton wasn't right about that. We also know that atoms of the same element can be slightly different. Uh, they're called isotopes. We'll learn about them later. Isotopes uh, have slightly different numbers of neutrons in them, but otherwise they behave the same way. The fourth one, atoms can actually be turned into different elements through nuclear reactions. This is what nuclear chemistry is about. In fact, in the 1950s, a guy named Glenn Seaborg actually managed to turn lead into gold. Now, it took millions of dollars to create just a few uh, gold atoms, so it's not exactly like you're going to make a million bucks doing this. But it is possible to working and tinkering around with the nucleus, which, of course, Dalton didn't know about. Right. But the cool thing about this theory is that the, this bullet, the third bullet, is the one that Dalton did experiments to prove. And it's still right even today. Dalton's experiments are still valid even today. And his theory, even though we, there have been tweaks around the edge, is still mostly right. Atoms exist. They uh, make compounds through simple whole number ratios. And that elements of uh, the same atoms of the same element are mostly identical, and atoms of different elements are all different, and that's really cool that it's still true even today. All right, there were a lot of questions. You don't need to know any of these, but uh, it ends up that this isn't the whole story. There was a lot more that was going on uh, later on. Um, these are some other people who tried to fill in the gaps in during the 1800s. Um, you will talk about all these people later this year, except for Brazilius, poor Brazilius. 
Uh, he's the one who came up with all the symbols on the periodic table and the masses that we use today. Uh, he doesn't get a lot of credit, unfortunately. But Avogadro, we talked about him on mole day. Uh, Avogadro's hypothesis is really important. Avogadro's also the guy who figured out that oxygen gas isn't just O, it's O2. And that explained a lot. Uh, for instance, Dalton, if you looked on the last slide, thought that the uh, formula for water was OH, just 1O1H. One oh, one and because of Avogadro's idea, they figure out, oh no, it's two H's and one O because air is O2. Uh, so Avogadro was really important in the history of chemistry, even though he has a really, really, really ugly picture. All right, it ended up when we started getting towards the 20th century and the experimental tools were much, much better, uh, they found out uh, new interesting things about the atom. All right, the most important part of these next slides is the experiments. You need to know the experiments. The pictures of the experiments are absolutely essential. You need to copy it down. Thompson discovered the electron, and he discovered the electron using something called a cathode ray tube. You're going to see a picture of this on the next slide. All right, so a cathode ray tube it was a glass tube with no air inside of it, or very little air inside of it. And when you hooked electricity, by the way, late 1800s, electricity had just recently been discovered, uh, that there was a beam that went through. And when you put a magnet up to the beam, the beam changed direction. Now, when you put a magnet up in midair, you don't see rainbows around it because magnets have no effect on light. But if you put a magnet up to a beam and the beam moves, it means the beam is made of matter. And it ended up that the matter that it's made of was negatively charged. So here's a cathode ray tube. Down here, the picture, here's the beam inside the tube. If you hold up a magnet to it, and the positive end of the magnet, if you hold it up, it ends up the beam is attracted to the positive end, so it doesn't stay there, it moves up. And if you hold a negative end up to it, the beam is repelled away. So again, cathode ray tubes, this is how electrons were discovered. There are electrons in that beam. The beam is not made of light, it's made of electrons. And electrons move towards a positive magnet, so that means electrons are negative. All right. Um, Thompson also found out that electrons are much smaller than atoms, so they have to be inside atoms. So that was really neat. Uh, he came up with the plum pudding model. You don't really need this drawing. Uh, you might want to copy it down because it's kind of important in the history of chemistry. Uh, but it, the idea is that uh, Thompson knew that there were atoms. He knew that there were electrons. He knew that if electrons are negative, there has to be a positive part to balance it out because atoms are not negative or positive, they're neutral. So he put an electron in a pudding. He was an English guy, so he thought puddings uh, of positive charge. So he discovered the electrons. He made a model with electrons. He didn't know what the rest was made of, but that's OK. Ernest Rutherford, this is the second experiment. This is the cooler one. Rutherford shot positively charged alpha particles at a thin sheet of gold foil. Again, new discovery, radiation, radioactivity, alpha particles. Alpha particles are positive little particles. And if you put a radioactive atom inside uh, a lead block and you shoot it at a very, very thin sheet of gold foil, we're talking ridiculously thin, it ends up that you would expect that the radioactivity would go through. That's not what happens. The radioactivity, some of it bounced back. Uh, Rutherford said he would, it was like as if you shot bullets at a piece of tissue paper and some of them bounced back at you. This was a ridiculous uh, experiment. They didn't expect this to happen at all. This would be explained, though, if inside the gold foil, the atoms had tiny, tiny little nuclei that were positively charged. So Rutherford came up with a nuclear atom. This picture here shows what's happening. Most of the alpha particles are going straight through because there's nothing there. This is the electron cloud. This is where the electrons are hanging out. It's all empty space with tiny little bits of electrons. And in the center is a tiny, tiny little nucleus that's very, very dense, and therefore the alpha particles are bouncing off of it because the alpha particles are positive and the nucleus is positive, so they're repelling. And so every once in a while, when an alpha particle goes near it, it bounces to the side or it bounces back. So that was Rutherford's great experiment. Uh, this is the nuclear model we know and love today. That's it for this video. I hope you found it interesting, and I got some more stories for you in class.